God where he is. Uh, this world can be a dark place. At times, it can be very difficult. Uh, but Lord, the Lord allows us saints to have uh, the light of life in his presence. And we certainly thank him for what he does for all of us. We should, certainly should be praying one for another saints. Continue to pray for the sick and shut in. Uh, continue to pray for those that uh, we don't see as much as we would like to. Uh, certainly it is um, a day in which we're living in where there is a lack of emphasis on the things of God and the importance of being together and uh, assembling ourselves together. Um, the Bible said that we should do so uh, the more as we see the day approaching. And uh, I believe that uh, we should be in a day where we have more church and not less. Can the church say amen? And there was times in our uh, history where... Um, some saints used to be at church every day. Praise the Lord. Don't get nervous. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And then they were there not only every day, uh, but they were um, there longer. Praise the Lord. But um, we uh, simply do try to uh, make, it, make being in the presence of God available for his people because we do walk in this world. And the Bible said that there is a washing of the water by the word of God. And so the tendency of the flesh is that if it is not, um, if we are not in communication with God, I should say, then um, the things of the world will try to stick to us. It is no different than um, us bathing ourselves naturally. We have to do that um, periodically. Um, I hope a lot, praise the Lord. <laughs> but... <laughs> The point is that we have to take care of these bodies, so it is in the spirit. We, the, we have to uh, be washed by his word. We have to allow the, the word of God, Bishop, to uh, do his job and to cleanse us. Can the church say amen? I want to thank everybody for your wonderful, and I don't know how long I'm going to say this, but I was just overjoyed um, by uh, all the uh, wonderful uh, words and nice um, things that were said. It was um, overwhelming. Uh, T had asked me what was the most, what was the thing I liked the most, and I was basically speechless uh, to see that response. And you know, I told the noonday Bible class that uh, we as pastors are not bulletproof. We 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 like it. We need encouragement too. And sometimes when you're pastoring, you you got your you got your nose to the grinding wheel, and you're working and you're laboring. But you know, but then when someone just says we love you, uh, it makes it all worthwhile. You know, it makes you just feel like, okay, well, Lord, amen, hallelujah. Because pastoring can be lonely at times. You, 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 it's some things that you just hold in your heart, burdens that you have to bear, but God gives you help. And then when you see the saints tell you that they love you, um, that is really something to behold. It makes you want to run on a little bit more. Can the church say amen? Let's go back into um, what we have been teaching on the... Uh, parable of the marriage feast. Let's go now back to Math Matthew chapter 22. And as we have already stated that this particular parable deals with the sum total of the whole plan of God from start to finish. It deals with what God planned to do for his 50,000 year plan of time. And that is that he wanted to get, of course, his bride Praise the Lord. And so he instituted time for that simple purpose. The simple purpose that we are down here, saints in the earth, is that God would get his church out of it. Can the church say amen? And we gave you some, um, some understanding of this particular parable um, in as much as there were various points. Now, as I've said before, points in a parable is not that important unless, the, unless there is an explanation of the parable or either... Uh, you can pull certain points out that align with the scripture. But the most important thing of the parable, or I should say details, excuse me, the details of the parable is not that important, but every now and then you can pull specific points without a parable if it aligns with the scripture. The most important thing is that you get the gist of what he's saying. What is he trying to make up? What is the point that the parable uh, is trying to make to us? And in this particular parable, is that he's trying, of course, to make us ready. 
And the point of this parable, let's go now to the 14th, chapter, 14th verse. Thank you, uh, Sister White Pigeon. Praise the Lord. Um, the 22nd chapter, let, and let's look at the 14th verse. This is the point of this parable. This is the reason why he gives it to us. Let's read. For many are called, but few are chosen. Can the church say amen? What he's trying to say is that he's, tr he's trying to make the point that he wants us to be ready so that we can be chosen. You follow me? Because, of course, he, he chose those that he chooses, which, of course, will be his bride. All of those will make it. Praise the Lord. But there were many that, have, that were called that did not make the process of being chosen. Now, in between the process of, of being chosen and being called is what is known in your Bible as sanctification or going on to perfection. And so, when we read this parable, you'll see that there were some that he called to the marriage supper, such as the Jews, as a nation. But because they counted the blood of the sacrifice of none effect and uh, did not, as a nation, receive Jesus, he had to go and send the, uh, the apostles out into the highways and byways or his servants to preach the gospel to the Gentiles to furnish the wedding. And what, whether we know it or not, the, the church will be made up primarily of a Gentile body. Can the church say amen? There will be uh, some Jews that will be in that bride, but for the most part, it will be a Gentile bride that he will get. Can the church say amen? All right, I don't want to go all the way back to the end, but I think we left off um, in verses numbers 8, somewhere along that line in this particular parable. So we're going to pick it up there, and then we'll read to the end of the parable, and then we'll continue to try to dissect this so we understand what God is trying to do, and that is to get his Gentile bride. Are you following me? Let's start with verses numbers um, 8. Then... Then said he to, the, to his servants, now these servants primarily would be the apostles in the New Testament. Remember, they killed um, the Old Testament um, servants that were sent to them, and eventually the Jews killed the apostles because the only apostle that died a natural death was, of course, John. But for the most part, all of them died since the riches and the martyrs' death. So he sent his apostles, or he sent his servants, read, the, ready, the wedding is ready, and they went out into, of course, um, a gen, the Gentile nations after the gospel was sent, of course, to the Jews first. Read, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Those, those that were bidden was who? The Jews. They were first given the right to God and to be a part of, the, of, of his bride. But as a nation, they reject him, and we showed you those scriptures I um, think it was a couple weeks ago, how they rejected him. Praise the Lord. His vineyard in which he had, of course, set a hedge about. He had given them a tower, which was um, the, uh, the name. He had given them a wine vat, which was, the, uh, which was the law. He put a hedge about them, protected them from all the other nations. He set his affection upon them, just as he's doing with the church today. You follow me? God has set his love upon his church. The Bible said, behold, now are, but behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. We have a manner of love that nobody else has. Can the church say amen? amen. And I made the point in noonday Bible class and also I think maybe a week ago that God made the church to be the center of his affection. The Bible said in one place, beauty becometh the house of God so he's trying to make the point says, uh, says that the church is the most beautiful place to be because he beautifies the meek with salvation. He says, how amiable are thy tabernacles. Can the church say amen? amen. And so the church is the best place to be. You follow me? Because in the world, you're going to have sorrow. You follow what I'm saying? So I found this out in walking with God, Sister Richardson, that being in the church is far better than anything I can get in the world. Praise the Lord. And so he gave them first rights. But inasmuch he came unto his own, the Bible said his own received him not. His own were the, were the Jews. They received him not, 
But as many as them that did receive him, he gave them power to become the sons of God. They had first rights, but they counted themselves unworthy. You follow me? So what did he have to do? He had to send his servants in the New Testament, namely the apostles, to go preach the gospel. Give them a right first, but then turn to us once they rejected it. And thanks be to God that they rejected Jesus, because if they did not reject him, none of us will be saved today. Can the church say amen? Because whether people know it or not, in those days, they counted Gentiles as dogs, as outsiders. Praise the Lord. But Jesus told, the, I think it was the Seraphonician woman, um, uh, she said, Yea, Lord, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And thanks be to God that we're not just eating crumbs today, we're at the table. Can the church say amen? amen. And we're dining in his church. Amen. Praise the Lord. Any good today? Amen. Let's keep reading here. They were not worthy. Go ye, Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye find. This would be the gospel going into all the world. Because Jesus told the uh, apostles, I think in the 28th chapter of uh, St. Matthew, he says, uh, teach all nations that they may observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. So he told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. So here we sing in the parable that because the, the marriage had to be furnished, they were not worthy. Now God is getting those uh, out of all the world, namely the Gentiles, to come and furnish his wedding because he's going to have one. We're going to be his bride. Now, we're not his bride right now. We are espoused to him. Let me show you that in your Bible. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is what Paul says to the church in which he pastored. We have been espoused to Jesus. We are betrothed or engaged to him. Now, a betrothal or an engagement can be broken off, but a marriage is legal and binding. Now, I'm going to tell you how, how um, powerful engagement was in those days. In their day, that was legal. And there had to be an arrangement for that to be broken. Because in many, many uh, cases in those days, Sister Casey, there was a dowry that was paid years in advance before the marriage actually took place. Now, we don't do that today, but in, but in, in westernized culture. I'm just showing you how important espousal was. It carried the weight of a marriage. Now, in our day, and what we do in America is that people get engaged, they give each other a ring, and then she burns the toast, and then you want your ring back. <laughs> this is what people do nowadays. Oh, wow. Praise the Lord. Oh, I'm upset today. I, I, I was watching something last night. People just do crazy stuff. Praise the Lord. Don't marry people they don't know, all kind of foolishness. Hallelujah. Where, where, am I, where did I tell you to go? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Amen. Let's get into the word of God. I'm going to show you this, that we have been engaged or we have been betrothed to Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, this is Paul speaking to the church at um, Corinth, in which he was the pastor. Verses numbers 2. Read. If I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Now, why he was jealous over them was because they were the, the, the church or the individuals that he pastored. Now, I can say as a pastor, I'm jealous over this congregation. Praise the Lord. Because these are the people that I've been given the obligation and the responsibility to pastor. Amen. So, as a pastor, I have a godly jealousy that if I see a wolf, I'm going to try to run them off. Amen. Why? Because this is where I have been given the responsibility to bestow labor in. Can the church say amen? So Paul is saying here, I am what? Jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Read. For I have espoused you. The, the now, let's stop right there. The you here in the first person is dealing with the Corinthian church. He said, I espouse you. When I preached the gospel and you got baptized in Jesus' name and filled the Holy Ghost, you were, I, through, through the preaching of the word of God, espouse you unto what? Read. One husband. Who's that husband? Jesus. Can the church say amen? Read. That I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 
that we have been espoused. Now we're going through the process of the chastening so that we can be presented or the preparing. Can the church say amen? Any bride makes herself ready for her wedding day. She gets engaged. Isn't that right? Am I right, Brother Phil? You get engaged. Then you, then you start to plan for your what? Wedding. wedding. You don't get, get engaged and say, well, I don't care what happens. I'm just going to show up. If y'all come, fine. It doesn't matter. No, sisters, you guys are meticulous. And what are we in the corner? We just in the corner saying, whatever. Yes, whatever you want. You fine. Whatever you want to do. It's okay with me. Just make sure you show up. Because all I had to do was get a tux. Walk down and stand in front of the church and wait for my wife to come. That's all I did. Ain't that right, honey? Did I go inside and say, well, I t- sometime, I, can I talk, talk to you for a minute? Sometimes I wonder why these brothers are so concerned about things that really shouldn't even matter to them. Don't get involved with all that stuff. Let her do her thing. Praise the Lord. Let her be a woman and you be a man. Don't be trying to go with her to pick the dress out. Tell her why you, why I like, look, what, let her do what she do. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm just trying to help you out. If you, want, if you don't want no headaches, <laughs> you follow me? Yeah. See, what we have to do, and I'm trying to sh- show you something, because so it is in the natural, so it is in the spiritual. Let the husband do what he's supposed to do, and let the bride do what she's supposed to do. So it is with us in the church. God has a responsibility. I have a responsibility. The, 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 the bride has a responsibility to prepare. The, the husband has a responsibility to receive his prepared bride. You follow me? You, praise the Lord. Now, the only difference between, as we do in, um, from a natural standpoint, what God does spiritually is that he's the one who's working on us. That's the only difference. When me and my and Tamara got married, I wasn't involved in no planning. She picked the colors out. Praise the Lord. I just said, don't, as long as I'm looking straight, this make me look decent. I don't need to be in some crazy stuff. But I didn't care about all that. You know why? Because all I wanted was my prize. You follow what I'm saying? So it is in the spiritual. God wants his prize. But he's working on us to get it. So because... They wouldn't receive it. He had to furnish the wedding somehow. Now, it was according to his foreknowledge that he was going to have a Gentile bride, and he knew that. But he simply is making a point in this parable of the extent that he went to go get what he wanted. So Paul is saying that you are, speaking, of course, to the Corinthian church, Tony, that they were espoused to one husband, Jesus. We are also espoused to him as we speak. And, and what the pastor's responsibility is, is to teach the word of God, praise the Lord, as we come into the threshing floor of the church so that we can be, all can be prepared when the marriage ceremony takes place or when the rapture takes place and then eventually the marriage ceremony takes place for the church. We are also being prepared. Praise the Lord. You follow me? This is the only way that God does it. He doesn't do it any other way. He only has one way to get his bride ready. And there are a lot of people who want to modify the process by which God has put in the earth to get what, get, get his, get what is his. Well, here's the point. If God has given us a way in which he does the job, I cannot try to change God's mind. I made the point in the Noonday Bible class is that God, he's unmatched. There's no equal to him. There's nothing that we can equate him to. You understand what I'm saying? And so what men try to do is that they try to fit God into what they think he is. The word of God asserts who God is. It doesn't define him because he's undefinable. It simply tells us what he wants us to know about him. God is more than anything that he tells us. You follow what I'm saying? See, sometimes we got to broaden our horizons. We got to think bigger than us because sometimes we say, well, God, you can only do this because this is the way I think you can do it. God can do what he wants to do. 
Now, he works, of course, Sandy, within the parameters of his word. But that word asserts what he's going to do. But he is bigger than what he ever tells us. God is bigger than anything he makes. This, these 66 books only asserts what God wants us to know about him. But beyond these 66 books, he's bigger than anything he says because he is his word and he's bigger than anything he wants to be. There's nothing that you can confine him with. So what God is saying is simply this. God, and I'm going back to my original point when I'm talking about preparing because that's what the parable is dealing with, talking about preparing. God prepares us the way he wants us to be prepared. I don't get to write the rules and parameters and the guidelines as to how I'm supposed to be made into what he wants. You catch what I'm saying? The word asserts to me what he wants, and then I have to fall within the parameters of that which he's told me. If I don't, I will not be prepared. That is what the problem with the Jews were. Praise the Lord. That when the vineyard ought to produce good grapes, it produced wild grapes. Why? Because they took the word of God out of that which he put among them and asserted what they wanted. And that is what people are doing today. And many of those individuals, when it's time for the marriage ceremony to take place, when it's time for the rapture to take place, and eventually that ceremony to take place at the end of the tribulation period, they won't even be there. Why? Because they did not allow themselves to be bidden to come and then go through the process. You follow me? So let's go back to the parable and let's see the process and what we have to have on. Somebody said, you got to have some on. It's called a wedding garment. Can the church say amen? All right, let's go now to back to the parable. Amen. When I say, let me see here. Back to the parable here, and then let's go. Let's start with verses numbers 9, and let's try to end it up. He says, go therefore into the highways, and as many as ye find, bid to the marriage. Now, this has to do, of course, with preaching the gospel. Let's keep reading. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as were found, both bad and good. Now, this is a powerful point because there's a parable in your Bible, we're going to read in a few minutes, of the net. The net is the gospel. The gospel is preached and then it draws into shore. That means the, sh the shore will be the church. But it's within the church that the good and the bad is, ship, is, is sifted. See, the gospel catches all type of fish. Some fish are good fish. Some fish are not good fish, even though it, they initially came in. You remember the parable of the, uh, of the tares and the wheat? Now, that's a, par that's a parable that deals, or it's a, I wouldn't say, I don't think it's a parable, but he was dealing with the enemy sowing tares among the wheat. That means the children of the enemy will try to come in and get among the children of God in the physical church. But within the church saints, there is chaff and there is wheat. You follow me? The chaff saints is, is a byproduct of ripened wheat. You can't have wheat without chaff. The chaff and the wheat come out of the same seed. So when he says here, good and bad, this is what comes into the visible church. Praise the Lord. The good are those that make it. The bad are those that would be chaffed. Can the church say amen? That's the reason why when he gets to the end of the prayer, he said, many are called, but few are chosen. You see, the doctrine of unconditional eternal security speaks along the, line, the, 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 the lines that nobody can be lost, so it doesn't matter how you live. That does, that does not fit with the scripture. Because the bad, and you're going to read in a few minutes, they're not gathered into heaven. They are discarded. But the gospel is preached to everybody. Praise the Lord. 
Some people are willing to go on to perfection, and somewhere along the line, they don't make it. Now, what we have to do as children of God, we have to make our calling and our election sure. Can the church say amen? We have to make it sure. How do we make it sure? By the way in which I live my life. I have to live in such a way that my calling and my election will be sure in God. That the calling that I've received into the church will be uh, final, uh, will be uh, my final destination, will be my election in the end. And we will make, the election will take place for us when the rapture takes place. Can the church say amen? Everybody that gets saved does not stay saved. You follow me? You get what I'm saying? This is what this parable is dealing with. He's making that point. So what did he say here? Uh, let's see. Be both, what, let's, keep, let's, let's read this. He says, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Read. And when the king came to see the guest, he saw there was a man which had not a wedding garment. So this is powerful. Now, some people say, well, this is the reason why you can't deal with parables and points. Because it would seem that the individual that he saw was in the wedding. That's not the point of the parable. You catch what I'm saying? If you read it that way. The point was that there were some that were bidden. They were called. But they were not, when the wedding took place, they didn't have the right garment on. You see, God did this intentionally so the natural man can pick the Bible up and get an understanding. Because if you read it, you would think, well, they were at the wedding, he looked at them, and then he told them leave. The only ones that will be in the wedding are those that made it. You catch what I'm saying? You don't get to the wedding and then he puts you out. No, you don't even make it to the wedding. You get the picture? Now, what are these garments? These garments that he's talking about is that they don't have the Holy Ghost. They're not clothed in his righteousness. The Holy Spirit is not, no, is not in them. They haven't walked with God according to his word and have, either have not received the Holy Ghost or had the Holy Spirit and did not walk with God and lost what they had. They're not clothed in his, somebody say, his righteousness. You, we have to have, somebody say, a garment. Let me get, take you to, uh, let me see here, uh, Matthew 13. Let me show you this parable here. Praise the Lord. Did we, did we read Ephesians 2 and 10 last week? Sister Hayes, did we read that? Okay, I'm going to give you that verse 2. That's going to deal with our call. But let's look at this parable that deals with the drag, deals with the net. And this is going to be fit a hand, like a hand in glove with what we're dealing with here. And as much as the gospel being preached and some were not ready. Because everybody does not count the blood of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ of enough value that they're willing to value their salvation after they receive it and then go on. We have this started. Remember Paul said in one place, when he got to the end of his life, he told Timothy, he says, I fought a good fight, I've kept the faith. Henceforth is laid on me a crown of life, the faith is not away. What he was saying was that I finished my course. My life, everything that I'm supposed to do in my saved life, I've done. He was ready to depart this life and go on to his reward. Well, actually, he was going to sleep in Jesus and eventually receive his reward. You get what I'm saying? He was, he was at a place where he knew that his life, in terms of his walk with God and all that God wanted him to do, he was finished. He left nothing undone. Can the church say amen? And I've told you this. I've seen the testimony of saints that have walked with God. And when they're getting ready to die, God puts them at peace. It comes over their face, and they would tell me, Pastor, I'm fine. I'm ready to go. Why? Because God has settled them in their heart to know that they have made their calling and their election sure. I watch your husband. I know what I'm talking about. I'm not making none of this stuff up. This is the way it is because we live to live again. We don't live to die. We live to live eternally. That's the difference. Can the church say amen? So remember, that, remember we just talked about the good and the bad. Now this is a parable 
of how the gospel is, cast, gospel is cast out as a net into the seas of men. What did God tell he was going to, what he say he was going to do to his apostles? Make them what? Fishers of men. When we preach, we're fishing. God does the sorting. We just do the fishing. Can the church say amen? We don't discriminate as to who we preach the gospel to. All souls have value to God. Can the church say amen? amen. Let's read verses number 47. This will be the last parable of the seven parables to the kingdom. 13 and 47. Praise the Lord. Again, the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is dealing with the church. Read. It's like unto a net that was cast into the sea. Now, this is a parable that is given to make a point. We cast the net out into the sea. Seas in your Bible uh, refer at times to peoples. Can the church say amen? We cast the net, preaching the gospel out into the vast expanse of people. Those that come. Read. And gather every kind. Can the church say amen? When Jesus gives, gives them the parable to go into all the world and preach the gospel, pray, or gives them the scripture going all the world to preach the gospel, he was telling them to go eventually to every kind. Now, it started with the Jews. It ended up, of course, with the Gentiles. Can the church say amen? About 10 years later. But in any case, this is exactly what they did. Read. Which when it was full... They drew, they uh, uh, draw to the shore, and sat down, and gather what good into vessels, and cast the bad away. Can the church say Amen? Everybody that comes in is not good. Follow me. Now, who makes that determination? I do. I make the determination whether or not I'm going to be a good fish. I make that determination. It's not Tony. It's not predetermined. Praise the Lord. God predetermined to have a church. He does not predetermine that some are lost and some are saved. He predetermined to have a church. In his foreknowledge, he knows who is going to make it and who's not. So he speaks as though the church is his already, even though he hasn't possessed it yet. You catch what I'm saying? I, I, don't, I don't want to get anybody confused. See, some people think, well, well man, if, I, if God predetermined me to be people to be lost, then why am I trying? That's not what he's saying. He predetermined or predestinated beforehand to have a bride. Because he's God, he knows who's going to be in the bride. You don't know that. But he gives us the right of choice to determine whether or not we want to be in what he already knows he's going to get. So when I live holy, I'm living in such a way that I'm believing that I'm going to be a part of what he determined to have. Can the church say amen? That's the reason why holiness is so important. I have to live holy. If, if I don't live holy, then God knows that, that I won't be in that which he determined to have because he knows I won't live holy. Am I confusing you? Can the church say amen? Am I making sense? I, if I live right, I'm simply making the point that I'm going to be a good fish. Can the church say amen? I don't be dragged to shore and eventually gathered into the garner or heaven. Can the church say amen? Those of Israel that killed Jesus, they sealed their fate that they were not good fish. Even though when he came, he was trying to call them in. Can the church say amen? You follow me? This parable, to a certain degree, fits in with what we're talking about in the uh, 22nd chapter. Let's keep reading here. Read. Let's finish reading it. Uh, 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 49, I'm sorry. Read. So shall it be in the end of the world. The angels uh, shall come forth and sever the wicked from the just and shall cast them into the, fire, uh, into the uh, furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and gash, gnashing of teeth. Let's go back to our parable here. 20, let's go three or four pages over, probably about four or five, depending on what kind of Bible you have. Let's go back to the um, 22nd chapter, and then we're going to give you some verses to support what we're saying tonight. So God is doing what, saints? He's preparing. He's getting us ready. 
His eternal plan for time is to get his bride. That's all he wants. He wants what he loves. Can the church say amen? And God has went to every extent possible and is going there, Brother Casey, to get what he wants. Can the church say amen? He's furnished everything in the earth for this one purpose so that he can get it. Us. Can the church say amen? amen. All right. Let me see here. Verses numbers uh, 12. Read. And he said unto him, friend, how canest thou, uh, cometh thou hither, not having a wedding garment? He was speechless. Read. Then said the king unto the servants, bind him, hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness, where there should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the point. Read. For many are called, few are chosen. Let's go now to Ephesians chapter number two and show us what he did for us to get us in here today. Can the church say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. He did all of this because he loved us. The Bible said in one place that he's waiting to be gracious. Ephesians chapter number two. And we can, I guess we can start with verses numbers 10, 10 through 13. This goes back to what we were talking about originally when we first started about them going into the highways and the byways and bringing and, and striving through the preaching of the gospel to bring us in. Can the church say amen? I, I wanted to give you this scripture to, to further make that point. Let's read verses numbers 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ. Now the church is God's work. It's his work of art. Praise the Lord. God is working upon the church. Why? To fulfill the 22nd chapter of Matthew. His eternal plan for time. You and I are part of that workmanship or the craftsmanship of the, of the master's hand. Now there is an illustration in your Bible in the 18th chapter I think of Jeremiah, if memory serves me correct, we're not going to go there, how he dealt with Israel. He sent, he sent the prophet Jeremiah down, Sister Tani, to the, to the potter's house. And he's told him to look how the potter wrought the work on the wheel. The potter was a metaphor of God. The pottery was a metaphor of Israel. And how he was a workman working upon them they became marred, he broke them, and then remade them. That is also an example to the church, how we are his workmanship. Amen. And when we come into the church, we're broken. Amen. Then we, he puts us on his wheel. Thank you, Lord. He begins to work upon us to get us ready for presenting us to himself. Can the church say amen? amen. He doesn't put us off on a shelf somewhere and leave us. He works upon us. So that he can mold us into the, what he wants us to be. Can the church say amen? So there's times when as he's working upon us, there are uh, imperfections. So he takes the word of God, praise the Lord, in the church as we are gathered together and being prepared for the wedding bishop. And he begins to smooth, the, smooth us out. Can the church say amen? This is how he does it. Going back to my original point, if people try to circumvent this process, then it doesn't matter if they were called, they'll never be chosen. Because the only ones that are chosen are those that allow themselves to be made. And because everybody has a free will, they can resist the master's hand. Or they can allow the master to mold them. Now how does the master mold me? He speaks his word to me. He deals with my consciousness about him, and then he, get, he tells me to do the work that I have to do on myself. Because there are two ways that God works upon us. Number one, he deals with our hearts to allow his word to affect us. Number two, he tells us to do the work that he deals with our hearts about. We have to partner with God. See, some people think that God will do everything for them. God is not going to get me up. I'm going to give you an example so you can understand what I'm saying. God doesn't make me get up and go to work. God doesn't make me study the Bible. God doesn't make me pray. 
God doesn't make me fast. God doesn't make me go to church. God gives me a desire to fast if I give him my heart. He gives me a desire through his word to study if I give him my heart. But I have to, I have to do the physical work. You catch what I'm saying? Now the false prophet is teaching that God is going to do everything for you. You just wait on it in the mail. That is a lie from the pit. You can wait for a check all you want. If you don't go to work and get it, the check ain't coming. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's why I say, Pastor, you tough. I know. Praise the Lord. It's just the way it is. The principles of reaping and sowing work. This is the reason why some people are blessed and some people don't have nothing. Because some people get up and work to get their blessing and some people just wait around and, and want somebody to give them something. Can the church say amen? Now why am I saying all this? I'm going all off the subject. The point is simply this, is that God will work upon us if we allow, allow him. The church is his workmanship. The church is that which he values. The Bible calls like as the church in a parable as a pearl of great price. A treasure that's hid in the field. Can the church say amen? Never feel like you as a child of God have no value. God did not give us the Holy Ghost. Give us a garment. That's what the Holy Ghost represents in that parable. A garment of righteousness that we keep upon ourselves walking in holiness for us not to have any value. And see, that's what the enemy tries to do, saints. He tries to make us feel valueless because we are still going through the process of perfection and we're not perfect yet. So because we're not perfect, he makes you feel like you don't have no value. Well, God would not have given you the Holy Ghost if you didn't have any value. Amen. Thank you, Lord. you see, I have to see myself as God sees me. And if there is an imperfection, allow the Holy Ghost and his word to work upon me and do the necessary, get, make the necessary corrections so that I can be all that he wants me to be. You, you follow what I'm saying? This is what the child of God has to do. When I first got saved, I, I, I was not what I am today. But I allow the word of God to deal with me so that he made me into what I am as you speak. Amen. Can the church say amen? So he buffed and he, and, he, and he scraped and he cut and he chiseled, broke, did everything he had to do so that he can make me into what he wants me to be. And I'm not necessarily talking about sin. Sin has to be dealt with according to the scripture. I'm talking about this being a human being. Praise the Lord. Some people just need to have an attitude adjustment. Praise the Lord. Some people just have a bad spirit at times. They get angry. They get upset. And they need, to hold it. They need God to adjust their attitude. Can the church say amen? Well, I ain't did nothing but you just got a bad attitude. You need to get yourself together. Mad and angry and pray. Let me stop here. Cantankerous. <laughs> you know what? That's a big word. Cantank. Some people just praise the Lord. You met somebody you, at work and they're just Sometimes we ought, we ought to smile sometime. Right, right. I understand you ain't going to be happy and on the mountaintop every day. Okay. But some t praise the Lord. Sometime. But sometimes I ought to crack a smile and say, it's going to be all right. <laughs> praise the Lord. Sometime. Amen. All right, let's read it. We are his workmanship created in what? Christ. How did he create us in Christ? When he came in the person, I'm going to give you a few scriptures to make that point. He came in time in the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then started to create us in the image in which he showed us spiritually when he came. Let's give you a scripture to make that point. Let's go now to Colossians chapter 1. Amen. I'm not making any of these things up. Praise the Lord. Colossians 1 and verses numbers 12. Mm -hmm. we had to have an image we had to have a picture of what God wanted so that he can make me into what he wants me to be so he sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh can the church say amen, amen. being holy without sin perfect in every sense of the word had no sin nature can the church say amen? Why? But he, he was giving me a picture of who he was. Can the church say amen? So that I would not compare myself to tomorrow and tomorrow would not compare itself to me. Because if we do that, the Bible calls us unwise. 
If I look at my wife and say, well, my wife is pretty good and I'm a little bit better than her, so I must be okay. That's nonsense. I will never be with a... I know know she understands what I'm saying because this is not what we do. The point is simply, I'm not supposed to look at you. You're not supposed to look at me. We're supposed to be looking at who? Jesus. Jesus. And this scripture is going to make the point. Let's read verses numbers 12. Let's start with verse 12. Read. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. He made us meet. He made us usable to be a partaker of what? The inheritance of the saints in life. What are we going to inherit? We're going to inherit all that is God's. And the Bible said, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. Everything that he possesses, we're going to have an inheritance with him. Y'all believe that? Yes. Praise the Lord. My father is rich in houses and lands. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And the church, somebody asked me a question about people who live in, who, who are, uh, who live their life and they get everything down here and that's all. And it seems like they're, they're living any type of way and they get everything they want in the world. And I made the point to them in Bible class. And when I answered the question is that Jesus said that they have their reward. What that means is this, if a person is only concerned about this life, then anything they get down here, that's all they're getting. If I'm living for my house, for my car, if I'm living for my wife, for my children, and that's all I care about, and I'm giving my whole life to them, I have no time for God, praise the Lord, that I don't want to serve him, then when my wife is gone, my, I'm gone or my children gone, that's all I got. But we're living for Jesus. (laughs) So we have an inheritance. And let me give you another point in passing is that, saints, if we are going to be the bride, the bride inherits the riches of the king. If we're going to be the queen of heaven, and he's the king of kings, whatever he has, we have. In the church, amen. He doesn't relegate us to being less than. We get the best. So we have an inheritance coming. Let's read here. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness? He's delivered us, Brother Bobby, from the kingdom of this world. From the prince, the power of the air, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. He's delivered us from those earthly kingdoms. Praise the Lord that the enemy controls we no longer live under the powers of darkness you see what God did in the beginning saints when he made when he separated light from darkness he set a precedence he that was to show a difference between good and evil so whenever you hear the term light it refers to good when you hear the term dark uh, darkness it refers to evil he took us out of darkness and brought us into this marvelous light So when we're in the church, we have a whole different system of living. Praise the Lord. We don't live the same way as the world lives. The same rules that they do, we don't follow the rules. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't do what they do. Why? Because he's translated me. We're going to read in a few minutes. I almost quoted the scripture. Read. Mm -hmm. From the powers of darkness and translated us. Translated us into the, let me see, delivered us from the power of darkness and translated. He has transported us spiritually into the kingdom of his dear son. The Bible said that you sit in heavenly places in Christ. The church in the earth as we speak is the closest place you're going to get to heaven until you get out of this body and receive your glorified body. But he translated us, transported us transformed us and put us into a different kingdom through the image of his dear son. Who is that image? Jesus. The body in which God inhabited. The flesh. He was the flesh of God. That was God's flesh. Can the church say amen? And he showed me, Sister Key, what holiness was so that I can be ready to put that garment on that he's trying to give me. So that the ultimate plan of time can be prepared. I tell us all the time, I can care less what the world is doing. The Bible told me what the world's going to do. 
They talked about me. Good. They're supposed to talk about us. They hurt my feelings. What do you think? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The world is supposed to do what the world does. It's not supposed to like you. Jesus said they hated me. Speaking to his, his apostles, deacon, and he said they'll hate you. Beware when all men speak good of you. I don't mean to be rough tonight. I'm just trying to make a point. Because sometimes, you see, what we have to do now, saints, is that we have to, we have to get tough. We got to get tough. We have to be holy. We have to walk with God. But we have to get some thin skin. I mean, that means some thick skin, excuse me. We got to be able to deal with some abrasive um, situations in this world and not lose our faith, lose our ability to stand up against the wilds of the enemy. Can the church say amen? I told you I'd give you testimonies where people jumped on me, beat me up, bloodied my nose. Praise the Lord. I'm telling you, I'm not making none of this stuff up. Got jumped on, got cursed out, said I was the devil, all that type of stuff, all because I was saved. Preaching on the street. Bishop, you sent us out to preach. We, one day we was preaching. Remember that deacon class we was preaching on the street? The woman took, came up and tried to take my mic out of my hand. Praise the Lord. I took my mic back and kept on preaching. <laughs> Praise the Lord. What, what is your problem? But I could have said, oh, I can't go back out there. They, just, they don't want to hear what I got to say. <laughs> you follow me? Can the church say amen? Sometimes, since the case, I just gotta, we just got to get it together. I'm just talking in general now. I'm not speaking about you at all. I'm just saying, sometimes I just got to get it together and, and say, I am, I'm, being on. I'm being worked on. Can the church say amen? He's working on me. Working on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus dealt with more hardship than we do. When he raised the dead, cast out devils, they said he cast out devils by the prince of devils. Praise the Lord. This is what they did because they were so evil. Sometimes you'll do good. See, sometimes we, we do something good and we want somebody to say thank you. Don't expect the devil to say thank you when you, when you, when you do something. <laughs> Don't, he's not going to. He's going to try to kill you. That's what he's going to do. Praise the Lord. When you do, when, I'm, I don't know why I'm saying this. I don't know why I'm saying this tonight, and I'm not trying to be rough. This is not my normal tact. But the point is simply this, saints. We are in this world, and he's working upon us. He's making us into his bride. He's grooming us. And sometimes in that grooming process, I have to get tough. Okay. Okay. I got to get battle hardened. God, I mean, excuse me, Paul told Timothy to endure hardness as a good soldier. Praise the Lord. Amen. Soldiers get battle tested through the adversity that they go through. I gave you the illustration of a Navy SEAL. A Navy SEAL, those men are the most conditioned individuals that you ever met. I'm not, I'm not talking about physically, I'm talking about mentally. You can literally drop a Navy SEAL in the Antarctic Ocean. Them guys will swim to shore, they will jump on a polar bear's back and ride somewhere to get... I'm just make, I'm, being, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating. You get the point. But they do, do your research. They try to drown them. They do all kind of stuff. They, am I right? They put them in those pools, put them in the water, and try to drown them. They ain't going to let them drown. But simply to make a point, they get them this equipment, the bare necessities. I'm telling you, what, I'm not making none of this stuff up other than the polar bear. But the point is simply this. <laughs> The point is simply this. Um, the point is simply this. They know they, they do that because their training equips them for their job. I'm being equipped to go with Jesus. So as I walk with God, this well, I got to understand I'm going to deal with some adversity. Praise the Lord. But that adversity is not there to destroy me, it's there to make me. You ever heard the, the term, what doesn't kill you only make you stronger? The things that we go through. And I learned this. And as I, was, as I walked with God and God began to show me what he wanted to do with my life, I realized I was going through that for a reason. So I could not act the wrong way. I had to deal with it. Follow me? I had to just bear up under it. Because it's obvious, Deacon, that God wanted me to deal with it. So if I was going to be saved, I couldn't try to get around it. Because you know what? If you try to get around it, it's going to come again. That's the way it works. Any test that we fail, we got to take it again and again 
and again and again. But here's the point in this verse is that he's translated us into the kingdom of his son. We as his workmanship created in what? Christ. Let's go back to Ephesians as we try to wrap this up tonight because I, I spent too much time already there. Let's go back to Ephesians, verses 10. He says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in. We're walking in the, the ordaining of God and the works that he has predetermined beforehand those that will be his workmanship will walk in. God has called us unto good works. He's called us unto works that profit. Spiritual works. We walk in those works and it proves that I am his workmanship. Can the church say amen? I am his craftsmanship. Verses numbers 11. He says, Wherefore remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh. Now he's speaking concerning the life prior to us being converted and saved. In times past we walked in the world or as Gentiles. Read. Who were called uncircumcision by those who, were, uh, who are called circumcision in the flesh. That would be the Jews. Read. Made by hands. Read. That at the time that ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel this was our condition to stop right there we were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel we were not a part of the original how can I say covenant with God that which he made with the children of Israel but because of the death of the testator the executor of the will Jesus Christ he brought us in through the word of God. And now he's furnishing his wedding. He's getting his wedding ready. God. Can the church say amen? He's getting, he's getting us ready. He's giving us the Holy Spirit, which in the parable was likened unto a garment that we are clothed in, in his righteousness alone. We walk in it, praise the Lord, being his Gentile bride, walking in good works, and eventually, when he comes, we'll be ready. God. And then he can get what he always wanted, and that was you and I. God always gets what he wants. Amen. See, some people think that God takes what, we, what a person gives him. That's not, the way that, that's not the way it works. God takes what he wants. Amen. It's no different in, your, in our lives. When we were uh, choosing somebody that, uh, to marry, we chose what we wanted. We chose a dress. We didn't pick the dress that didn't nobody else want. We chose the dress that we wanted. You sisters know what I'm talking about. Y'all, praise it. Now, I'll keep talking if I have to. When we go, when you got, praise it, when you go to get a dress, you just go, and, I don't care which one, you get, just give me that one. No, you go and you move stuff out the way and put it up to the light, look at the material, all can, look at the tags. See, praise it. All that time, am I right? And then you put it on. Put another one on, take that one off, put two or three more on. And we sitting at that looking like, what is going on up in here? <laughs> Why? Because we're choosing what we want. Amen. So if I can make a choice, certainly God can. Amen. Can the church say amen? God will get what he wants. Can the church say amen? All right? Mm -hmm. we, uh, he says, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel... And strangers from the covenants of promise. There are covenants of promise, promises that God has promised to those that he has a covenant with. He had covenants of promise with the Israelites. Praise the Lord. But they were bidden and didn't come. And now he's given us those covenants in the New Testament and promises. Let me show you a scripture. I'm going to show you something so you can see what I'm talking about. All right. The scripture just came to my mind. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. To show us that you got a promise. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Covenants of promise. Praise the Lord. We have promises that God has designed to give us. But I have to be worthy of it. So we have to qualify for what God wants to give us. It's, praise the Lord. Amen. Let's read verses numbers 1. Having therefore these precious promises dearly beloved. Who's the dearly beloved? The bride to be. Can the church say, man, the son of God in the earth, you and I. So don't we have promises? Amen. He promised to give the Holy Ghost to all those that will come. 
He promised to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Can the church say hallelujah? There's promises to walking with God. One day we'll teach on the promises of God so you can see. There are things that God, saints, has to do for us. Okay, let me give you, give you an illustration. The state of Michigan, those of you who has children in here, the state of Michigan told you when you had children, there are laws that you have to feed them. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make a point here. Whether we like it or not, we have to do what the law said if the children are going to be mine. I'm a child of God. God is my father. He has parental responsibilities to me as a child of God that he has to do for me because I'm his. He has to take care of me as I give myself to him. So I don't have to beg him to be a father. My children don't have to beg me to, to be their father. That's my job. And if I don't do it, since the hand of the Bible said I'm worse than an infidel and has denied the faith. I'm talking about me today. If I don't be a father, I'm not saved. But I'm saved tonight. Can the church say amen? But I'm just trying to make a point so we understand. If God, if we understand that, then we have to do certain things based upon the law. And I can't say, well, you know, uh, judge, I didn't know that I was supposed to feed my children. Well, they're going to say, well, you know now they're a ward of the court. That's exactly what they're going to say. Am I right? I didn't know that I was supposed to sit them out with no clothes on in the middle of the winter. You see, some people think that type of stuff. Well, I don't know. So, no, 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 no. God, if, if we have to do it, God also does it for us. Can the church say amen? Having, therefore, these precious promises, dearly beloved, because we have these promises that he said he would give to us, look at what we do. Let us cleanse. Hold on. Let, let God cleanse us. Let us cleanse ourselves. Remember I said we partner with God? He gives us the word. He gives us the promises. He says, if you do this, I promise you I'll do this for you. So now I have to let myself partner with him so that the promises that he wants to give me, I receive. Okay. In the church, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Just like you promise your child, if you wash all of those dishes, I won't have to. Let me stop. You wash all of those dishes, I'll give you some money. I'll use that for the example. And if they don't wash the dishes, they don't get no money, right? Amen. Not in my house. I would hope you wouldn't give them the money if they didn't do nothing for it. Amen. Because when, when they get grown, trust me, they can't go up to the, uh, to the job and say, I want some money. Money come. This is what they're saying now, Bishop. Money cometh to me. Oh, yeah, right. They're going to tell you, no, not my money. <laughs> you follow me? Let me stop here. Let me, let me get back. Somebody say, Pastor, get back on target here. All right. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. There's filthiness that comes out of the flesh and filthiness that comes out of the spirit that God has given us promises that if we cleanse ourselves from it, praise the Lord, we will receive the promises that he wants to give us. Can the church say amen? I'm looking to get my promise. I'm looking to get what God told me I would have, so I'm working to be a part of that which God has promised to give me. Can the church say amen? And let me show you another scripture that, calls you, that shows us how he called us in. Let's go now. As we try to wrap this up, let's go to the book of uh, e e uh, Zechariah, chapter 6. Some, he called us from a long ways off and brought us in. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 15. This may be our last verse. You guys have been such a wonderful audience today. Praise the Lord. And you look so nice. Amen. So I may let you out early. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Don't count on it, though. Verses number 15. Now, we're cutting it to, we ended up, we actually, we're at the end of the thought here, but let's just read this for the sake of the Gentiles being called in. 6 and 15. Zechariah chapter 6 verse 15. Are you with me? Let's read. 
And they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord. Now, this is a prophecy, P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y. This is a prophecy that speaks of the calling of the Gentiles from afar off or from the highways and the byways and being called in. Why? Because God wanted to furnish his wedding. So he called us. You, you follow me? Far off, we will come and build. Somebody saying the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord here refers to the church. The church is referred to in some places as a temple. It's referred to a, as a fitly framed building. It's referred to as the house of God. We are referred to as tabernacles, houses of clay. This is all in your Bible, all biblical expressions. So this is a prophecy concerning him calling us into the church who were far off. Now, the apostles, when they first started their ministry, they thought that this scripture meant the Jews that were far off because there were Jews that were in the, pal were in the confines of Palestine or of, of, Ju uh, of, of Jerusalem. They were called the Jews, Tony, that were nine. But the Jews that had been scattered in the other nations were called the Jews that were far off. It wasn't until God gave Peter the vision on the housetop of Joppa concerning the great sheep, in, excuse me, that, was, uh, that had all kinds of creatures. Those creatures were, were reflective of the Gentiles being called in. And he told them to rise, Peter, slay and eat. And Peter said, no, not so, Lord. I have not eaten anything unclean since my youth. And then Jesus uh, tells Peter, he says, that which thou, uh, don't call that which thou, which is God is cleansed, unclean or common. I'm, I'm paraphrasing now. And it, God opened his, up his understanding that the Gentiles were going to be brought in. Then God was working on the other end of a man by the name of Cornelius in his household, sent to uh, Simon, the son of uh, or Peter, excuse me. Peter came to Cornelius' household, preached the gospel 10 years later. And this scripture was fulfilled. That those that were afar off, which we just read, if, if memory serves me correct, I don't know if we read it yet, we'll get, we get back to it. In the book of Ephesians, we'll read it, that we were, those that were afar off have been made nigh by the blood of Jesus. We were long, far from the peaceful shore, out in the hedges and the highways. God sent the gospel to us, saints brought us in here, and now we are being made ready for the marriage feast. Let's go back to Ephesians so we can wrap this up tonight so I can show you, wrap up what I just said to you in that, in the, in that quick, um, those quick few minutes. I'm, 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 I'm kind of rushing here because I want to get to the end of this Bible class. Can the church say amen? All right, let's finish up with verses 12. And then he goes on to say, having no hope and without God, in this world then there is a colon there which means there is an explanation to follow read but now in Christ Jesus you who were sometimes afar off did we just not read that prophecy that those that were afar off will be called to come and build in the temple that was us they thought it was the Jews that were outside of the confines of Palestine they didn't know that in two God saved, starts saving Gentiles and brought us in. Paul knew that now. He's speaking to here a Gentile church and letting us know that we have been now called in and we are being made ready for the marriage supper. Can the church say amen? He's furnishing his wedding. You follow me? Mm-hmm. Far off. Are made nigh. By the blood of who? Christ. Can the church say amen? I'll end it with that tonight. And then we'll come back next week and we'll finish this Bible class up and show you how he did all of this. Let's, um, if there's any questions, I guess we can, uh, we can have them right now on this subject. Any other subject?